Okay, then, uh, this is the vitreous state, fundamentals of the vitreous state. Good morning to everybody. We have an, a nice uh, class this year. This is 2017, August 2017. The fundamentals of the vitreous state, uh, it's a very basic uh, graduate level course that we teach here at the Federal University of São Carlos in Brazil, at the Vitreous Materials Laboratory. And the key idea is to cover the very, very basic concepts about glasses. Viscosity, relaxation, glass transition, then the definition of glass, which is quite complex and very controversial. Some important phenomena, such as the Kautzmann paradox and the kinetic spinodal temperature, all these concepts are related to relaxation. Relaxation. Glasses relax as a function of time. And then, Another important feature of glasses is structure. The structure of glasses, of course, is different from the structure of, of crystals, but there are many ways to describe the structure of glasses and the relationships between the structure of glasses and relaxation phenomena and also crystallization phenomena, which is the third part of the course crystal nucleation, crystal growth, overall crystallization, it's the combination of nucleation and growth, glass forming ability, how easy or how difficult it is to form a glass, and glass stability against crystallization. What happens when you heat treat a glass? Does it crystallize easily or not? And finally, <coughs> Applications, glass ceramics. Some of you here will be doing your thesis in glass ceramics, materials that are produced by controlled crystallization of glasses. So glass ceramics, uh, the successful development of glass ceramics depend upon how well we understand the crystallization processes. So these three parts here, are the key phenomena related to the vitreous state. Relaxation processes, structure, and crystallization processes. And these three parts must somehow be included in the definition of glass. And so far, until last month, they were not. Maybe Two parts were included, but not the third part. Depending on the definition, one part was included, not the other two parts. You see how many definitions there are about glasses, and we are going to propose a new and, and more complete definition of glass. So, to start with this class, we we'll deal with the viscosity of glasses, because viscosity controls relaxation processes and crystallization processes. And also viscosity controls the forming of glass, the melting of glass, the fining of glass. It's easy to understand that viscosity is the most important property of glasses. Viscosity. So we start with viscosity. This is the first year that I start this class with viscosity. Okay? The viscosity of glass forming oxide liquids. As you know, there are many glass forming liquids. There are metallic glass forming liquids, organic glass forming liquids. There's also pol polymer glass forming liquids. I mean, organic with high molecular weight, but this class will deal with 
oxide glass forming liquids. You know, the common glasses, although the concepts can be applied to any type of liquid. These are basic concepts which are valid for all glass forming liquids, but the examples I'm going to use refer to oxide glass forming liquids because I'm most familiar with oxide glass forming liquids and that's the focus of the research work that we do in this lab here in São Carlos. So, viscosity, right? Before I start with viscosity, let's talk about the most important plot in glass science. In this plot, you can draw like any property here, actually. It could be the density, the thermal expansion coefficient, uh, the entropy, or the volume, or the enthalpy versus temperature. This is a very nice plot because it shows in one figure the process of vitrification. If we have a material with a melting point or a liquidus temperature, the true liquid only exists above the melting point or the liquidus temperature. It's thermodynamically stable only above the melting point. Now, if we cool down a liquid, any liquid, slowly enough, and by slowly enough means slowly enough to allow crystallization, then crystallization will take place. The material will solidify, will form crystals by nucleation growth. So this is the most stable form of matter, thermodynamically stable form. All liquids love to crystallize. They will work hard to crystallize. They will do their best to crystallize if we give them enough time. Now, some materials um, have very slow crystallization rates. So for that type of materials that we call glass forming substances, we can super cool the liquid, averting crystallization. So we can quench the liquid or cool it down and crystallization will not take place. So this state is called super cool liquid. Of course, if we stop here somewhere in a high enough temperature and wait, it will crystallize. It will crystallize. All liquids will tend to crystallize. And the time it takes to crystallize depends on the temperature and the chemical composition of the material. For instance, metallic materials crystallize extremely fast. Or liquids like water or ionic liquids in general crystallize very fast. These mixed ionic covalent materials such as oxides, some of them, silicates and borates and germanates and tellurites, crystallizes slow enough so we can supercool the liquid, supercool the liquid, supercool it until we reach a certain range of temperatures where the liquid can no longer follow that equilibrium or metastable equilibrium line and freezes in. And the, the, the correct word is freezing, not solidifying. Solidification means crystallization, forming a true solid. Freezing means uh, uh, becoming rigid for a certain time. The definition of frozen is rigid 
for a certain time, like frozen by fear. You're frozen for some seconds, not forever. You're frozen for seconds. Or frozen shoulder. I once had a frozen shoulder. You know, I hurt my shoulder playing golf. So I had a frozen shoulder. I could not move my shoulder for one and a half years. But after one and a half years, it's unfrozen. So that's very important. Freezing is not solidifying, it's not solidification. So a glass, you can see a glass as a frozen super cool liquid. The super cool liquid was <coughs> being uh, relaxed and it relaxed and relaxed and relaxed. But the relaxation time, which is the inverse of it, of, uh, which is proportional to the viscosity, uh, beca becomes longer and longer and longer and longer until at a certain point the relaxation time, the relaxation time is longer than the experimental time. And that's the best definition of the glass transition. It's a point where the experimental time or the measurement time is shorter than the relaxation time. So the liquid can no longer relax. It freezes in without crystallizing. It freezes in without crystallizing. Now, if we, for instance, use a higher cooling rate, where would this temperature would be? If I use a higher cooling rate, like we do in the lab, we quench the glass between two steel plates. TG would be higher. TG could be here. So TG depends not only on the chemical composition of the material, but also on the way it's measured. Higher cooling rates, higher TGs. Slower cooling rates, slower TGs. Another way to see this is that, okay, for a given cooling rate, we came to this path here, made the glass, all the way down to room temperature. And then we heated this glass up to some temperature here below that TG. And wait, the glass will relax. And this relaxation time, of course, depends on the temperature. If we are here close to TG, say five degrees Celsius or so below TG, it will relax in minutes. If we are, I can give you this number because we have measured in this lab, about 50 degrees Celsius below TG for a given glass diopside, it takes about six months or so to relax. Six months to relax at 50 degrees below TG for a particular glass that we have studied. It depends on the fragility of the glass, but that's a number that you can uh, have in your minds. And if we are at room temperature, it will relax. And we can calculate how long it will take for a glass to relax. But glasses spontaneously relax. This is the, the first key feature of glasses, they will spontaneously relax. All glasses are being are relaxing. Even at room temperature, they are relaxing. A little bit. It will take a long time to fully relax, but they are unstable. Glasses are unstable. They will spontaneously relax. There is no uh, thermodynamic barrier for relaxation. Only a kinetic barrier. It only needs time. All glasses, my eyeglasses here, they are relaxing. 
they are relaxing. Of course, at room temperature, they will take very long to relax, right? But if you have a polymer, and the Tg of this polymer is 30 degrees Celsius, and we are here at 26 degrees Celsius, it will relax in a few weeks or so. Now, the Tgs of the typical oxide glasses are all above, say, 300 degrees Celsius or so from 300 to 1200. That's why it takes a long time to relax at room temperature. But for polymer glasses, it may, they may relax in minutes or in weeks at room temperature. So it depends how far we are below the Tg of that material. But the, this is the first message that I'm giving in this, in this class. Glasses spontaneously relax all the time, but it doesn't stop here. After relaxation, they will continue the, this process until they crystallize. It may take even longer, but they will someday eventually crystallize. And later on in this course, uh, you see that uh, we can calculate how long it takes to relax, how long it takes to crystallize for any glass at any temperature. Summary, liquid, supercooled liquid, frozen supercooled liquid, which is a glass, which is unstable against relaxation. And then, when it comes to the supercooled liquid, it's metastable against crystallization. Because then, um, the supercooled liquid needs um, to overcome a thermodynamic barrier for nucleation. Once one crystal is formed, then again it's spontaneous. Crystal growth is spontaneous. So the key step here on crystallization is the formation of the first nucleus. Once the first crystalline nucleus is formed, there is a thermodynamic barrier for that. That's why the supercooled liquid is metastable. It needs to overcome a thermodynamic barrier. One nucleus is formed, crystal growth is spontaneous. It takes time, depending on the chemical composition and on the temperature, but will, the, in the end, crystallize. Why I'm saying this? Because this is the first class, so you have an idea already of, of the glass transition phenomenon. I will talk more later on about this, but to introduce the concept of viscosity, because this is a viscosity class, the relaxation time of the supercooled liquid, the characteristic relaxation time, is simply the viscosity at the temperature T divided by the shear modulus, which is calculated at infinitely high frequency. At very high frequency of mechanical um, strain, stress, um, measurements at infinite frequency, you can calculate infinitely high frequency of the shear modulus. So it's almost temperature independent. This is a temperature independent because it's calculated at very high frequency. But the viscosity is temperature dependent. This ratio, this is the Maxwell, this is the Maxwell, the physicist Maxwell uh, came up with this ratio is a measure of the characteristic relaxation time. If you want to calculate the relaxation time, typical relaxation time of any glass, you can take the value of viscosity and do this calculation. Let's do one for Tg. We can calculate this for, for Tg. It's known, empirically known, that uh, this kind of uh, 
break here takes place in the lab. When you do in the lab experiments in a laboratory, in a laboratory, TG is observed at a viscosity of about 10 to the 12 pascal second. People have done this. They have measured TG with DSC, DTA, with uh, thermal expansion analysis. There are several methods. And then they measure the viscosity at that temperature. This is about 10 to the 12 pascal seconds. For normal, I should say, this is from DSC, DTA, and other methods which normally use a heating rate or cooling rate, heating or cooling rates of, say, 5 to 20 degrees Celsius per minute. For this kind of measurement, TG is 10 to the 12. Now, G infinity, this G zero, which is equal to the G measure at infinite high frequency, is about 30 gigapascal for oxide glasses. So this number is the characteristic relaxation time would be 10 to the 12 pascal second divided by 30 gigapascal. So 30, 10, to the 9 Pascal, which gives what? 33 seconds. 33 seconds, half a minute, is the time it takes to measure for this kind of cooling or heating rates. This is in, in half a minute or so, you can measure these things. So this is, this is why, this is why TG normally is observed, is detected, where the viscosity is 10 to the 12 pascal seconds. For oxide glasses, for these types of techniques, which use 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees Celsius per minute, if you do much high Heating rates, there are now DSCs that can go to 10,000, 10,000 degrees Celsius per minute. We have one in the lab who goes to 1,000, but there are newer equipment who can go much higher. Then the TG will take place at the place where the viscosity is lower. Or if we measure TG by molecular dynamic simulations, which have extremely high cooling rates, then TG would be somewhere here, where the viscosity is maybe 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 5 pascal second. So I'm trying to make clear that TG is not a thermodynamic temperature, like the liquidus, or the melting point, or the transformation of alpha quartz to beta quartz, 573 degrees Celsius. You cannot, you cannot define Tg for any material. You can say Tg is approximately 550 degrees Celsius for a soda lime silica glass as detected by DSC at this rate here. So to normalize things, you know, to 
to be useful, we normally, instead of writing only TG, we say TG12. This is a very good way to define TG. TG, for all practical purposes, is the temperature where the viscosity is 10 to the 12 Pascal second. Okay? Is this clear? It's very important. TG, TG is a very, very important concept related to the vitreous state. And it's related to viscosity. That's why I'm taking time to start to explain this graph here. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this plot again uh, during uh, the several classes. But this is, I think, the, uh, a good way to introduce this problem. So let's then talk about viscosity. Yeah. Sir, sir uh, what will happen during the relaxation in the structure or the properties after during the relaxation and after the relaxation? Yeah, the structure accommodates itself. Like you, you can visualize here instead of enthalpy, if you write here volume or a specific volume, the inverse of density, you see that the glass would densify one percent. 3%, 5%, depend, depending on how far you are from TG, the glass will densify. If the glass is densified, the structure is a little bit accommodating, not huge changes. You know, the overall, the overall distribution of rings, the distribution of Q1, Q2, Q3 units, how the tetrahedra are, are, are shared, and, will not change much, but it will accommodate. So there are, there are subtle changes in density, and that's how you measure relaxation, actually. You can measure the density as a function of time, or the refractive index as a function of time, or even the viscosity as a function of time. Everything changes a little bit. It's not hundred percent is one, two, three, five percent. This kind of changes in density or CTE or refractive index or viscosity. You can pick any any property to measure. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, what about uh, stresses inside the glass? Stresses. Um, uh, I I will talk later on about the stress relaxation, but things you mentioned this stresses. They appear because if I have a glass this thick, I'm producing a glass which is about one and a half centimeters thick, and I'm cooling down. What happens when I cool down? The surface is cooled much, much faster than the interior of the glass. So instead of having one curve, I have one curve for the surface here and another one here for the interior of the glass. So if you come down to room temperature, um, it's like if you had different volumes for different parts of the glass. That's not possible, so you have stresses. You have permanent residual stresses due to the different cooling rates. Now, another important operation of glass, we are not talking about glass technology here, but since you asked, is to annul these stresses. How, how you annul these stress? You bring down this material again, here at TG, and wait for 30 seconds. But to be on the safe side, you wait for 10 minutes or so, just to be on the safe side. So the stress is relaxed, and then you have to cool down very slowly. Because if you cool down fast again, they will form again. So this temperature is very important also from a, a technological point of view, to relieve stresses. All glasses have to be annealed 
Otherwise, they have residual stresses and sometimes they break, spontaneously break. How many of you have seen a glass breaking? I have seen spontaneously break, maybe two or three times in my life, in my house or so, in some, boom, hey, a glass has shattered. Why? Because it has internal stresses which cause uh, some cracks to slowly grow, 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 and sometimes they break. You know, there's slow crack growth and other problems. So annealing is a very important operation. There is one type of glass. I always ask this in my classes. Which type of glass does not need to be annealed? Of the oxide glasses. Which type of oxide glass does not need to be annealed? Pure silica, maybe, because the thermal expansion coefficient is very, very low. But in general, I'm talking about glass shapes. Which glass shape for any composition does not need to be annealed? A sphere? A sphere? Fibers. Why? Why fibers do not have to be annealed? Speak loudly, please. We are recording. Much more surface thin. They are very thin, and there is no difference between the surface. They are very thin. They are very thin, so there is no difference. The surface and the interior come in the same way. So any very thin, very, very thin material uh, does not have uh, internal stresses. A sphere will have internal stresses. If you have a large sphere, the surface will be cooled down much faster than the interior parts. And this is a problem you cannot solve. You cannot fast cool the interior of a glass. There's no way, you know, to get the heat out, especially because glasses are, have low thermal conductivity. Glasses have a very small, uh, um, very short phonon-free path because they're, they're disorganized. So they have all oxide glasses have very low thermal conductivity, which means a large gradient in temperature. The surface is always cooled much faster than the interior. What if you have very thin plates of glass? There will be very thin stress even because plates are larger, larger, but it's very thin. No, if you have a very thin, if you have a very thin plate of glass, there will be very, very low level of stress. Very, very low level of stress. Um, because there will be no gradient. You know, if, if the whole plate is cooled down at the same rate, there will be no, no residual stresses. Of course, when we make in the lab, sometimes, you know, in the lab, some liquids are very good glass formers. We, we are going to talk about glass forming ability later on in this uh, class, but uh, uh, some materials are poor glass formers. Like people who work with metallic glasses, they suffer a lot because metallic glasses are all poor glass formers. You have to cool them very fast, otherwise they crystallize. But even we have troubles, like Mina is doing a PhD work in a very tough glass ceramic for dental applications, but her glass has a poor glass forming ability. But we need to make like six millimeter thick samples, right, Mina? One. One centimeter. One centimeter. One centimeter. To make one centimeter thick sample, uh, with a poor glass former is, is, is very difficult. So we started by doing, you know, one millimeter glass samples. You, you cast the glass, 
you cast the glass in a steel plate and then you press with another steel plate, for instance. So you have a one millimeter glass sample, no problem. Two millimeter glass samples, no problem. When we tried to make nine or 10 millimeter glass samples, crystals were forming in the interior of the glass. Because you cannot cool down the interior of the glass fast enough. So we had, and there is no way to get heat out of the interior. So we had to change the composition. Our strategy is to add some elements that decrease uh, the crystal growth rate of those crystals by increasing the viscosity. See viscosity again. We have chosen two particular oxides that increase the viscosity. So this is just an introduction. I'm going to come back again, but I refer you, I think you could take this paper, it's available in the internet, The Glass State of Matter, its definition, ultimate fate, in the Journal of Non-Crystalline Solids, it was published last month, I think, and we are going to talk more about this. So try to find this paper and take a look before the next class. Okay? Viscosity then. This was a rather long introduction, but I believe it was an important one. I have already said that the definition of glass transition, this is the best definition. The glass transition happens when the relaxation time, which is given by this expression, is longer than the time of measurement of the experiment. There's a very interesting thing that we are going to talk uh, later on uh, some other day. What happens if you get this curve here and extrapolate this curve here? At some stage, this curve will cross the crystal curve. And this is a very interesting theoretical temperature. We cannot measure this because it's well below Tg, so it takes a long time to measure. But this is the so-called kinetic spinodo, where the crystallization time becomes shorter than the overall relaxation time. So this is the TKS we are going to talk maybe in two weeks or so about TKS. But this is an interesting theoretical temperature. People have been discussing and publishing theoretical papers. These are all uh, problems related to the glassy state of matter. Okay, viscosity. Viscosity of known liquids. The viscosity of water, water, is very, very low. 0.001 pascal second. 0.001. So this is the viscosity of water. Very low viscosity liquid. That's why also it crystallizes so fast. It's extremely difficult to make glassy water. You have to cool it down extremely fast because the viscosity is so low that the crystallization rates are very fast. Also, the chemical composition of ice is exactly the chemical composition of liquid water, which again facilitates crystallization. But this is a very low viscosity liquid. And then we have glycerin, one pascal second. This is the viscosity of molten glasses. Molten oxide glasses at 1500 Celsius or so have viscosities between 1 and 10 or so pascal seconds. This is very, very important material. Benjamin, you could explain to these guys what maple syrup is. That's what I had for breakfast on Saturday. It's the, the, tree, the sap from the maple tree that we boil down and make into a very sweet syrup for all kinds of desserts or breakfast. It's delicious. But it takes 40 liters of tree sap to make one uh, 
leader of maple syrup. So it's incredibly concentrated, sweet, delicious thing. Delicious thing. Next time you go to Canada, make sure you bring one to this old professor here. You know, this is a delicacy from Canada. You know, I had some friends in Canada, when they visit me, they bring maple syrup. Now I know that the viscosity of maple syrup is somewhere here, you know, two or three um, pascal second. It's definitely much more viscous than, than water. You know, you, you can see it, it, it slowly flows. You know. Honey is here. Honey is a little bit more viscous than maple syrup. Honey. And toothpaste, 100 pascal second. You know, toothpaste is really viscous. You see that you have to press it, you know. So this is the kind of viscosity from 1 to 100, I should say, that you see for most molten. By molten, I mean above the liquidus, above the liquidus. Uh, oxide glasses. Metallic glasses suffer from this same problem. Their viscosity is maybe here when they're molten. That's why they crystallize very fast. So one key, one key rule of thumb for a gl good glass forming ability, high viscosity at the liquidus. Materials which have a very high viscosity at the liquidus are good glass formers in general. This is not the only parameter. There are thermodynamic parameters. Crystallization depends on kinetic and thermodynamic parameters, but that's a good one. If you had to choose one property for good glass forming ability, high viscosity at the liquidus. And that's why, Graziel, I told you some time ago to try to get the, the viscosity at the liquidus. You and, and, and Giannini are trying to find these data because they are important. If you're going to predict the glass forming ability of liquids, that's a good one to get. Not the only one. It's not, it's not only proportional to the viscosity, but it's a good one. So this is a general, you see, you can vary four orders of many orders of magnitude here, many orders of magnitude for different liquids at room temperature. Of course, if you heat these liquids up, the viscosity decreases. And that's the most important feature of glass forming materials, how much the viscosity increases or decreases uh, with uh, <clears throat> heating or cooling down. Of course, the viscosity, you, you know this, but just for the sake of completeness, is the liquid resistance to flow how much a liquid resists flow. This is a measure of viscosity of the liquid. This is a, one example that Marcio used to work here with me. He did a lot of work about viscosity years ago. He is a professor now in Salvador, in Bahia. But this is the viscosity of uh, one of Benjamin's favorite uh, materials, diopside. Benjamin is a worked uh, with geosciences. This is an important mineral, uh, diopside. It, it's a good glass forming material. You can form good chunks of glass with diopside. And uh, it's stoichiometric, so one by one by two moles. So it's interesting for crystallization studies because the crystals have exactly the same composition as the parent glass. And this is good if you're uh, intending to understand what's going on. Anyway, several authors have measured the viscosity of diopside, and you see this is log of viscosity in Pascal second versus temperature. How much it varies from minus one here, Pascal second, uh, the liquidus is somewhere here. So all this part here is above the liquids. Minus one Pascal second to 10 to the 14. 10 to the 14 Pascal second at TG. This is about TG. Well, TG is 10 to the 12 here, right? Here is TG of this glass. 
So it varies many, many, many orders of magnitude. And this is the importance of glass forming materials. You are able to work with the material because you cannot work with water. I mean, how can you produce a shape like a, even a fiber or a, or a glass cup like this from water? It's, the viscosity is too low. You form, it will deform. You form, it will deform. You need something with a viscosity of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8, somewhere here to be able to shape any material. And, and, and this variation of viscosity allows that. If you want to produce a block of glass or a sphere of glass or a tube of glass or anything or a glass bottle, you need some viscosity here which um, is high enough so you form and it doesn't spontaneously relax. Now, first point, glass forming, this is not a good glass forming material, this is not a good one. This is a glass forming material but not a terribly good one. And it has another problem. Why there is no data here? All the data points are either close to the liquids or close to the TG. Why? Nobody has been able to measure the viscosity here. Many authors work with this glass. It crystallizes. It crystallizes very fast. See, the liquidus, the viscosity at liquidus is very low. It crystallizes very fast, so you cannot make a glass cup like this. Because the time it takes for you to present, it will crystallize. You cannot even measure the viscosity. So several materials. So this is not a good glass forming material in the technological sense. You cannot produce an article. I mean, you can produce microspheres or something with very fast cooling rate, but not a glass bottle or a tube. So this, uh, I, I picked this plot because it gives you many, many important information. How many orders of magnitude the viscosity varies, the problem with crystallization, and also, I will be talking about in a few minutes. You can fit, you see this green curve here is a fit with this equation here. This is the famous Vogel Fulcher Thurman Hess equation for viscosity. You can fit very nicely, very nicely to all this data here except for some outliers. These are called outliers. We leave them out of the fit, right, Graziella? And uh, fit a nice curve here. And there are several viscosity equations which are proposed to describe the viscosity in a whole range of viscosity, 15 orders of magnitude in this particular case. We are going to talk about then uh, viscosity equations and crystallization. But this is a, a nice example. Okay. So, by definition, viscosity designates the melt resistance to flow. Under shear or normal stresses, any type of stresses, even here, if you leave a piece of glass here and heat it, by the gravity we will make it flow and wet the substrate, so any kind of stress, because they're liquids. Liquids do not stand any type of stress, even tiny stresses, they will flow. Of course, the higher the stress, the faster they flow. But any tiny stress is enough to flow, to make them flow. Um, and it varies, 14 orders of magnitude or more. 
It is this feature that makes it possible to give glass almost any kind of geometry, any kind of geometry. This high, this variation of viscosity. So you get to a point where the viscosity is high enough to allow you to shape the material. Viscosity determines the conditions from melting and refining. This is the kind, this is the log of viscosity, the kind of, of viscosity that you need for melting to homogenize the, this material and refining is elimination of bubbles. Glasses in general have bubbles and you have to eliminate these bubbles. So about 10, because this is in log, log unity, so this is 10 pascal seconds. This is where you melt and refine. And then uh, for working, for shaping the material, you need viscosities from 10 to the power 1.5 to the power 7. That's the working range. And then annealing range. 10 to the power 11 or so to relieve stresses. Uh, and uh, well, the upper temperature of use, I mean, to be used when the viscosity is above 10 to the 14 Pascal second, it will no longer flow appreciably. You know, that's when the glass becomes rigid. I do not like to say the word solid because solid in my opinion, is a true crystal, but rigid, rigid. Above 10 to the 14 Pascal second, it's rigid. It will not deform in our time scales. It will deform in, I don't know, several, several, several years, but not in our time scale. Okay, so this is a plot which summarizes all these ideas, log, viscosity, temperature. We have at very high temperatures, melting, refine, refining, and homogenization. If we have chemical elements, we have to give time for the glass to be homogeneous. And this is a problem, because people who work with chemistry in general, so certain students come here from chemistry, they get they are used to working solutions. So they get water, put NaCl here, one second, five seconds, it's homogeneous, not with glasses. Because the viscosity here is 0 0.0001 Pascal second. The viscosity here is one or 10 Pascal second, 1,000 times more. So it takes time to homogenize to produce homogeneous glasses, it's a science and art. Science and art. You have to mix very, very well your powders, give some time for, for the convection currents to work, and if possible, you have even to stir the melt with a platinum blade, for instance, to get homogeneous melts. It's not trivial. So, work here. melting, refining, and then uh, <clears throat> the glass has to flow in the furnace, industrial furnace. I'm talking about furnaces which have 100 meters long or 50 meters long. A glass has to flow. And then this is where we um, work with glass. Work, I mean shape, shape from this range of viscosity and this is the range where you have to anneal it, heat it up and cool it slowly to relieve stress. So this is a nice overview of these operations. Uh, so it's a summary of everything. Very rough. I mean, this is not melting point is a only 10, it's a range. No, that glass is more or less molting at this range. It starts to work here from 10 to the two to 10 to the seven, 
and the annealing point is here and below 10 to the 13.5 or 10 to the 14, you are safe enough. It will not deform any longer under the gravity. So it takes, you know, to make a glass, you start here and end up here where the viscosity is 10 to the power 40 or so at room temperature. At room temperature here, the viscosity is even much, much, much higher. Okay. Now, I think you have seen this in your undergrad courses already, but just for the sake of completeness, how the viscosity is defined. If we have a plate here, which is fixed, and we have a fluid between two plates, and this one can be moved by a shear stress tau, and this is the y direction, by definition, the coefficient of viscosity, or simply viscosity, is, is just the, uh, the coefficient be between the applied stress and the gradient. This is u, the velocity, du, dy, the gradient of velocity. So this is the parameter that we are interested in, the viscosity. In this particular chapter, the author, Joachim Doibner, writes eta zero, but uh, most people do not write eta zero. There is no need to use this zero here, but I'm following this chapter. Uh, this is just the viscosity, eta. So it's the constant between the shear stress and the gradient of velocity of the fluid, which is given here by this drawing. You know, it's zero at the plate, which is steady, and maximum velocity at the upper plate. That's the definition of viscosity. Okay, well, the details, I'm not going through the details because I'm, I'm talking about all these details, and I have sent you the chapter yesterday, although I did not have the emails of some of you guys, but I did send this, all the material by email yesterday. You can read it. Anyway, I'm going to skip this part because it's just explanations for, for that figure, and I have already sent the written materials to you. Uh, just uh, one important point is that the SI, in SI units, the viscosity is, viscosity is giving Pascal second. So one Pascal second is one Newton per second per square meter or one kilogram per second per meter. In industry, however, viscosity is commonly expressed in terms of the CGS system and the unit is POAS. So one, one POAS is one Pascal second or one Pascal second is 10 POAS. One POAS is one deci Pascal second. So one Pascal second is 10 POAS. I'm giving this because in some old books or technological books, you find the unities in POAS. So pay attention when you're getting data for these unities are easy, easy to confuse. Poise versus Pascal second. Okay. Now, from rheology classes, I think most of you have had rheology classes, and there are many different rheological behavior types. I'm not listing all of them here. There's Bingham type. There are more complicated behaviors, but all glasses will follow one of these three behaviors, I think, or most glasses by far. They are Newtonian, where the, <coughs> the stress and shear rate are directly proportional. So the Newtonian flow, uh, the viscosity of a Newtonian liquid, viscosity of a Newtonian liquid will not depend on the shear rate. So we can measure it slowly or fast, 
and the viscosity will be the same. It only depends on the temperature and chemical composition. This is always chemical composition and temperature, but not shear rate. Although I have seen several papers and have worked with this problem, after a certain critical shear rate, the, the viscosity starts to decrease. So glasses are more or less Newtonian. They are Newtonian up to a certain shear rate. For very fast shear rates, they are non-Newtonian. They are shear thinning. The viscosity decreases with the shear rate. And this is very important to know if you are working with fast-forming processes, for instance. With fast-forming process, the shear rate is very, very high, so the viscosity decreases with shear rate. Now, other glasses, so this is Newtonian. Viscosity is independent of shear rate, but as I said, at some stage, it starts to be shear thinning. Shear thinning means viscosity decreasing with shear rate. And chain-like glasses, like metasilicates that Graziella and Giannini are getting data from metasilicates, they are, or diopside, for instance. Diopside is a metasilicate, because there is one mole of calcium, one mole of MgO, two moles of silica. That's a metasilicate. There are Q2 glasses. By Q2, I'm going to give a class on uh, glass structure, but just for you to know, you know, this, if we talk about silicate glasses, all silicate glasses, the, the, their structure is built of silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen tetra, um, tetrahedra. Q2 is a notation that says that on average, two corners per tetrahedra are shared. So they have, this is a called bridging oxygen. So two corners shared per tetrahedron. This is a Q2 glass. We will we'll talk more about this, but Q2 glasses, they form chains. If two corners, on average, are shared per tetrahedron, they easily form chains. They are, they are molecules. If you had an electron microscope, you'd look at the molecules, they would be chains. If they are chain-like, when um, stresses are applied, the chains try to align along the direction of the stress. So they become shear thinning, you know. The faster you strain, the more they align and they become shear thinning. And also, most of the fragile, I'm going to talk in a minute or two about fragile glasses, they are a little bit shear thinning for high enough strain rates. That's what I told you here. They are either shear thinning from the beginning, or they are Newtonian, and after some critical threshold stress, they become shear thinning. Another point, can you give me an example of shear thickening? Is there any glass which can be shear thickening? The viscosity increases with the shear rate. In ceramics, you remember in this ceramics class, what type of ceramic material is shear thickening? Some clays are tear thickening. And if you think about why some clays are tear thickening, it's because they are like plate-like or so, and 
they can easily slide if you use a small shear rate. You give time, they slide. If you do it very fast, they are blocked against each other and cannot slide, so they are shear thickening. So what type of glassy material can be shear thickening? Pure Why? Mm, because uh, it has a very high viscosity. Yeah, very high, but pure silica is Newtonian because the structure does not change with shear. Glass ceramics can be shear thickening. If you have a glass with crystals, crystals like plate like crystals, maybe your material is shear thickening. We have to test this at some stage. Your materials have plate-like crystals in a glass matrix. I bet these materials are shear thickening because if you use small shear rate, very slow, these plates will slide and you find some way to flow. If you apply the stress very fast, they cannot flow. So I, several glass ceramics are shear thickening, but glass ceramics are not pure glasses. They're glass matrices with crystals embedded, you know. And you need a certain volume fraction of crystals, a certain shape. Not all glass ceramics are shear thickening. If you have spherical particles there, they're not shear thickening. Or small volume fractions are not shear thickening. So I bet you need a certain high volume fraction with elongated plate shaped or whisker type of crystals. Okay, so these are the three classical uh, behavior of glasses, but most of them behave in this way here. Newtonian, for all practical purposes, for all practical purposes, small enough shear rates during Newtonian, luckily, because it's easier to deal with Newtonian fluids. But um, this is one example, you know, Soda lime silica glasses. If you if you're not familiar with glasses, soda lime silica glasses are window glasses. Window glasses are soda lime silica glasses. They have sodium oxide, calcium oxide, silica, and impurities. A little bit of alumina, a little bit of magnesium, a little bit of iron. But soda lime silica glasses are typically 15% of sodium oxide, 10% of calcium oxide in 72, 73% of silica and 3, 4% of other elements such as alumina and MgO and iron and so on, and potassium a little bit. Soda lime silica glasses are the most um, frequent glasses that you find everywhere. Bottles, windows, this glass, this is a soda lime silica glass. And they are sheer thinning. This is a classical paper by Joe Simmons published in the Journal of Non-Crystalline Solids. It's a very nice journal, with very good editors. Uh, this, uh, this paper was published by Joe Simons. Professor Simons was the previous editor of the Journal of Non-Crystalline Solids. And they did the very interesting work with fibers in the Conan cup. There are several ways to measure viscosity. One of them is Conan cup like people using ceramic barbotinas, right? But at several temperatures. You see here in this curve, this is the viscosity divided by the Newtonian viscosity. The Newtonian viscosity. You see, it's more or less constant. The shear, the strain rate is here. The strain rate is here. See, this is more or less constant, but after some stage, the viscosity divided by the original Newtonian viscosity decreases a lot. So, shear thinning, even soda lime silica glasses. But luckily, most commercial operations work in this range here. You know, commercial forming operations, they are not so fast. So, it, it's Newtonian for commercial operations. But if you are dealing with pulling fibers, for instance, at a very high speed, it will be here. So the actual viscosity is smaller than the viscosity that you have measured in the lab. 
Okay, so keep in mind that people in books, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> say that glasses are Newtonian, but not always. And most are not. Another interesting feature of viscosity, now I'm plotting, I'm plotting log of viscosity versus 1 over t multiplied by 10,000, but it's 1 over t. And why we are plotting this way? Again, soda lime silica. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight types of soda lime silica glasses with more, more silica, a little bit less silica, more alumina. They vary from producer to producer. So these people here, they took eight types of soda lime silica and uh, divided in this inverse temperature scale three regimes. One regime above the liquidus, you know, the liquidus for a non-stoichiometric material is the temperature where no crystals survive. There's no crystallization above the liquids. Above the liquidus, the liquid is the thermodynamic stable um, state of matter. So they found an Arrhenian behavior here, but I'll tell you that I'm not so convinced about this Arrhenian behavior because the actual data were in a very short range of temperature. So you can always fit a straight line. Arrhenian is a straight line. In log versus 1 over t, a straight line is Arrhenian. But, okay, they, oh, maybe Arrhenian here, maybe, I, I'm not so sure. Then, highly known Arrhenian, this is one feature I like to emphasize to you. The viscosity is highly known Arrhenian, in most part. See, it's curved. Even log scale, it's curved. And then really becomes Arrhenian at Tg. So this is the non Arrhenian part that most glasses show by far, curved. So the activation energy is changing. The activation energy is the derivative of this curve. It's proportional to the derivative of this curve. See, it's increasing, increasing, increasing as the temperature decreases because this is 1 over t. And then becomes a Rhenian. He took the lower bound and the upper bound because there are eight glasses here. But, you know, the upper and lower bound, it becomes a Rhenian. And this is the so-called isostructural viscosity because this is where Tg happens. When Tg happens, the glass becomes frozen for a certain time. So the structure does not change anymore. That's why it's called iso. Iso means same. Iso, structural viscosity. Curved iso structural viscosity. This is So this is the so-called equilibrium viscosity, and this is the isostructural viscosity. The point is 1 over Tg. Of course, if we take a long time here to measure the viscosity, the glass will relax, and the equilibrium viscosity is given by the extrapolation of that curve. So this is that same relaxation phenomenon from iso to equilibrium viscosity. This is relaxation. So one has to measure the viscosity faster before the actual glass relax. This is the 
isoviscosity. <coughs> Iso is structural viscosity. So two things here. Um, I, this question mark is not there in the book. This is my question mark. I very much doubt if there is a real Iranian behavior here, because if I forget this part here, which was hand draw, there's no real Iranian behavior, apparently. It's just a curve. And then uh, this highly curved part, and then isostructural viscosity again. This is the key feature of the viscosity of most glass-forming oxide liquids. Any questions? OK, um, I'm going to go very quickly to this table. This is people have invented many ways to estimate the viscosity of liquids. For instance, sometimes, like for you, Graziella, and you, Giannini, if you are interested in only measuring the viscosity at the liquidus, you can use some methods. There are some methods that you have a liquid, you can, for instance, put a sphere in the liquid and measure the time it takes to, to sink down. If you know the geometry of the sphere and, and so on, you can calculate the viscosity of the liquid. Simple methods. People had, like people who work in the glaze industry, they just want to see you know, the viscosity of the glass enough to uh, wet uh, a tile, a ceramic tile. So they use simple methods like the half sphere, the sphere method, softening point, deformation point, sintering on set. Powder, P means powder, M means monolithic. So if you are interested in sintering, people work with sintering of glasses. You have a glass powder, a glass powder, you can bring this glass powder to a heating microscope. We have one here at the LAMAV. And see when these particles start to sinter. The sintering on set, the viscosity is about, is about 10 to the 9 Pascal second. These are simple methods. Simple methods. Some are standard. All the ISO methods, G's and ASTM, G's, ASTM, ISO, ISO. Some are standard methods to evaluate certain points of viscosity. Uh, there are approximate methods which are easier to do than normal viscometry measurements, but good enough if you are only interested in certain regions of viscosity. Okay? It could be useful to us at some stage. But the real methods are here. There are many methods. I'm not going to describe all these methods to measure the viscosity. And it's easy to understand why there are so many methods. This is because the viscosity varies from 14, 15 orders of magnitude. There is not a single method which is capable of measuring all uh, the viscosity in all this range. So there are many, many, many methods. As I said, you can even look at how long it takes for a bubble to rise to the surface. If you know the radius of the bubble, uh, the density of the glass, and you, if you can measure dH, dT is the velocity. This is the velocity of bubble rise. Then you can calculate the viscosity. Or falling sphere. You have a sphere, the radius of the sphere is known, the density of the sphere is known, the density of the glass you can measure. If you measure again the velocity of sinking, is 
the, the viscosity is always inversely proportional to this viscosity, and so on. There are many methods. Here at, uh, in our lab, we have the rotating cylinder method. This method, uh, you have a crucible, a platinum crucible, with a molten glass in an inner cylinder. So you measure the torque as a function of temperature. Of course, all this is inside the furnace. Inside the furnace, you measure the torque, which is imposed by the molten glass to the cylinder, and then there's an equation which allows you to calculate the viscosity for the low viscosity range. So the log of viscosity between one and five Pascal second. Now we also have this parallel plate. Two plates, a glass cylinder, a glass disc, and all the parameters I know. Again, we only have to measure the velocity, the velocity of the formation at a fixed temperature. You always fix the temperature, you do it, then you change the temperature, you measure again, change the temperature, measure again. It's time consuming, but it can be done. This is for the range between uh, the log of viscosity, seven to about nine or so. And finally, the sphere or cylinder penetration for the high viscosity range between eight and 14. This is how we measure the viscosity at this very high uh, viscosity range. So here we use one, two, three, with three methods we can cover the whole curve, most of it. But it takes two weeks or so to do all these measurements. It's very time consuming, but it's possible to do. Okay. The details you can find in the, in the chapter, how the equations are derived. And so there are simple equations. Now, which equations can be used to, now to describe the viscosity or to extrapolate the viscosity? Like here, you know, we can measure the viscosity from the melting point you know, up to the glass transition range. But if you, I want to know the viscosity at room temperature to do calculations or to see where the Kaussmann temperature is or to calculate the kinetic spinodo or to estimate the time it takes to crystallize below Tg, we need to know the viscosity below Tg. So we can measure fit with one of the equations, but we also want to extrapolate here and there. So what's the best equation? There are, for oxide glasses, about 15 equations that I know of. Maybe there are more. At least 15 equations are available to fit and then to extrapolate or interpolate viscosity data. Because as I said, if you recall the plot for diopside, we have only measured at very high, very high viscosity, very low viscosity, but we interpolated these viscosities with one equation. Is that the best equation? Which one is the best? It's a key question. A very successful equation was derived by Vogel, Fulcher, Tamman, and Hess independently. These are three groups. Vogel and Fulcher uh, well, it's four, four independent, four independent works. Fulcher, Vogel, Tamman, and Hess, in about the same years, they proposed this type of equation to describe the log of viscosity. Remember that those days, there was no internet. So these guys were working in, you know, in the US, in Germany, in Russia, in Germany. They did not know that somebody else was working. They did independently. And they tested different oils, honey, you know, 
maple syrup, glycerin, different materials which were easy to measure at you know, lower temperatures and, and they had data points and they tried all possible combinations of polynomials of, and they found that this is a good one. Log of viscosity is equal to a parameter plus another parameter, T minus C1. So it's with three unknown parameters, A1, B1, and C1 were unknown and had to be fit to the viscosity curves of whatever materials they had. But they found that this equation fitted very well, really well. And it's still used for glasses these days. Uh, we have tested and used this equation fits from here to here quite well for most glasses. But it has one problem. Which is the, take a look at this expression. So log of viscosity is A1 plus B1. T is the temperature, C1. So these parameters A1, B1, and C1 vary from glass to glass. For each composition, there are three parameters. Which is a theoretical problem with this equation? It's empirical, but what happens when the temperature is equal to C1? It goes to infinity. So this equation predicts, the prediction of this equation is that it will go to infinity at some temperature, 1 over C1. When the temperature tends to C1, it will go to infinity. This is strange, because why the viscosity will go to infinity? There's no clear reason. I mean, you can see that the viscosity will increase and increase and increase, maybe goes to infinity at zero Kelvin, but I'm talking about, if you see numbers here, this C1 is like 400 degrees Celsius, you know, 450 degrees Celsius, 250. Why the viscosity would go to infinity? So there is this theoretical problem, but it does a good job between the liquidus and the Tg. It's good enough, it fits well. The problem is that it predicts a diverging temperature when the viscosity goes to infinity. Now there is another one, Adam Gibbs, I'm going to explain in more detail in the next transparencies because this is more complicated. Then the Avramov Milchev, by the way, Isaac Avramov he spent six months here in this lab years ago. He worked for six months here as a scientist from Bulgaria. And uh, he developed a different equation. Again, it's three parameters. So all these equations have three unknown parameters. This A3, B3, and C3. But the beauty of this equation is that it does not diverge. It's the, it, it, it goes uh, to a finite value. So here's the overall picture. Equilibrium viscosity, isostructural viscosity. The Vogel-Fulcher-Thurman diverges at some temperature. So this is the vogel fulcher tama hess The Isaacs, or the avram milchev equation, these are data. This is 1 over Tg. Goes more smooth it never diverges. This is the Avramov-Milchev. 
But here, they work more or less equally well. And then there is this Maiega equation, people from Corning, John Mauro, Yui from Denmark, Ellison from Corning, Professor Gupta from Ohio, who also spent some months here at Lamav, and Alan from Corning, so a group of Corning, Denmark, and Ohio, they came up with another equation, the Maiega equation, with one, two, three unknown parameters also. You have to fit this data with three parameters. And also, the beauty of this equation is that it comes here between the Avramov, Avramov Milchev and the Vogel future. So this is the Maiega equation. There are many others. I'm not going to discuss all of them, but the nice thing is that all of them are in between. If you plot with all the 14 or 15 other equations that are normally used for oxide glasses, you know, you see that they, they are in between these, these three equations. So it's nice to know that this gives always a lower bound, this gives an upper bound. So if you want to calculate, extrapolate data well below Tg, you can use, and you don't know which one is best, use this one and this one for an upper bound and a lower bound. For a lower estimate, for an upper estimate, and you have the range where the real truth could be the real true value could be. Anyway, um, I think we have to stop for today. But before I do so, do you have any, any questions? No questions? Thank you very much. See you all next week, same time here in this lab. <laughs>